In 1 John 2.18, it talks about the last hour. And he says, uh, you know, little children, it is the last hour. On the grand scheme of things, yes, it's hyperbolic language. It's been the last hour since the first century. Very glad you are joining this broadcast. I just want to remind you, please subscribe if you like some of these updates I'm doing and some of these Bible studies. Also, please like this video. And if you look at my, my name down under this part over here, click on it. You'll find the remainder of my videos. I'm by no means finished with some of these studies. Please like and subscribe so that you can get more information. And thank you for coming by. A seminal passage about which there is very much controversy is uh, comes to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter. And although the, the chapters in large part are at least most importantly about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is information in here about the nature of our glorified bodies and how that comes about and perhaps the timing of it and that that is where most of the controversy comes about is the timing of all of this um, there's one perspective that the timing of all of this is at the rapture of the church from another perspective the timing of this is at the second coming of Jesus Christ um, I guess you could probably say that there is a third perspective on this that says it happens both times to different groups. But anyway, let's take a look at this and um, see what this passage has to say. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, let's just begin with verse 35. This is from the ESV, and... Um, some people might like this version and some people might not, but for our purposes here, we can take a look at this. There are many versions we could use, um, but for ease of reading and ease of understanding, um, we are going to use this here, and I invite you to take your favorite translation and open, open it up to 1 Corinthians 15, beginning verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come, you foolish person? What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and each body or each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same. But there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable or corrupted. What is raised is incorruptible or imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, I want to stop here at the end of verse 44 and point out that um, what's being described here is the nature of the body, the physical body, and the way it's raised. Notice it doesn't, it says spiritual, it doesn't say spirit. Um, some religions will teach that there is a spirit body, you know, Mormonism and so forth. But resurrection always refers to the physical body human um, and natural refers to this earthly body in our current age spiritual body is refers to um, that which is imperishable 
that which is raised in glory, that which is raised in power. And as opposed to verse 44, natural body versus spiritual body. See, those two contrasts are what we have here. The natural body versus the spiritual body, not the physical versus the spirit body. So if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, speaking of Christ, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust, speaking of you and me, and as the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So he's leading all this in to tell us what we are transitioning from and to, and how that uh, in that regard we are like Christ. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Um, in other words, um, to keep it brief, there was much confusion among the disciples about the kingdom of God, and they thought Jesus was coming and that he would overthrow the Romans and establish his kingdom right there. And you'd have the eternal kingdom right there on earth, and it would go on forever and ever. But these bodies aren't designed for that. These bodies aren't made for that. Before these bodies can be made for that, the Son of Man must die, die on the cross, and then be resurrected to um, demonstrate that he has that power and that authority. And so the disciples didn't at first get that. They didn't understand that. So what we have is Christ, his righteousness is imputed unto us, and our bodies must be changed, must be converted, because these bodies are not prepared for an eternal kingdom, right? Um, I'm getting ready to have a, a birthday later on this month, and trust me when I say um, the aches and pains continue and they grow, and over the years, that will continue should the Lord tarry, and I hope he does not. Um, and so the maladies and things that afflict us with um, age and uh, illnesses sometimes, these things, these bodies are just not made to inherit an eternal kingdom. So we have to be changed. Um, we have to be prepared spiritually first, and then these bodies have to be changed. As we began reading in, up in verse 35, uh, this body is just a seed, okay? So again, we'll back up verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is anything that was kind of mentioned maybe in the Old Testament, but not really fully revealed um, and um, Paul, it's an interesting study sometime to look up the word mystery and go into the New Testament and, and find several mysteries that God revealed uh, to the Apostle Paul. And this is, this is among them. So here's the mystery. We shall not all sleep. We know that this is a, a biblical term for die. Um, but we shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. One way or another, we will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality, which is just exactly what I was what I was saying. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where 
is your victory, O oh death, where's your sting? So backing up to this passage that is so famous, so controversial, um, verse beginning verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep or we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. But we find, for instance, in Revelation 20, there are two resurrections. And these aren't, they are first resurrection and second resurrection. And these aren't classified and meant to be understood as, um, in particularly, chronological order, so much as they are a classification of two different types, two different resurrections. Uh, one is for, the first resurrection is for the saved. And you want that. You want that's the glorified body. The second resurrection that is raised to be judged, and we see that resurrection um, at the uh, great white throne judgment. Um, those particular bodies are bodies that are made to last forever, but not in glory, but rather in the lake of fire. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So we have this thing called uh, the trumpet that will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So when does that happen? What does that look like? And there's where some of the controversy is. We hear about a trumpet and everything's changed and I don't know if it's something the Lord uses with that trumpet to um, change it and to call folks forth. But um, for the believer, we're just speaking in terms of the believer, um, we are changed and we will put on immortality. Now, the difficulty, as I've pointed out before, is that when we are speaking with respect to the second coming and we're looking at the this resurrection that's spoken here at the last trump many people will say that that happens at the second coming all our bodies are changed and um, then we move on from there uh, the time time frame moves forward we go into the next age now the difficulty with saying that that passage is speaking of the second coming is that at the second coming if we are all changed and we all put on immortality um, we have some we have some difficulties as far as um, Matthew 2230 is one such place that says that we we will be as the angels who neither marry nor are given in marriage um, so by extension, that means that once we are immortal, we are no longer marrying and we are not, no one is making babies. Um, God would not, did, when he described marriage, he did not describe a state of being where um, making babies is okay outside of marriage or that that would happen. And that's not what the, the um, angels um, of God do. Um, so by extension, if our next state where we put on imperishable means that we do not marry and we'll have our glorified bodies, we have a problem because we have many, many passages in the Old Testament that speak of um, life during the kingdom of the Messiah on the earth. Um, where do the babies come from? Um, we have descriptions, of, for instance, of a, a child who will be able to play in a pit of vipers and not be bitten. Where did that child come from? We read in Revelation chapter 20 that um, at the second coming, uh, Satan is bound in chains for a thousand years. So if he's bound for a thousand years 
And then after the thousand years, Revelation 20 tells us that he comes across the plains. He's amassed himself an army to go up into Jerusalem and to go against the Messiah and his people. Um, who did he recruit? If everybody's believers and everybody's got glorified bodies and nobody's sinners, where did Satan recruit an army? Because the problem is that we have no mortals going into the kingdom if everybody's been glorified at the last trump at the second coming. And it just, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Jesus must rule with a rod of iron. Who does he need the rod of iron for? Um, we read in Revelation uh, 21, for instance, and we read about the tree with the many leaves that are in it um, that are for the healing of the nations. Why do the nations need healing if everybody's got glorified bodies? Um, I, you know, we could go on in, in this manner. Um, you've got uh, Old Testament scriptures that talk about um, the nations, for instance, Egypt, that if they make a decision that they aren't going to go up into Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, um, God will shut off their reign. Well, why would they make such a decision if they're in glorified bodies and, and they're sinless? See, so last Trump cannot be at the second coming for that reason. There's a logic problem there. Uh, many people will point out that, well, it says in the last day, that at the last day, um, Jesus will do this, and then this will happen in that the last day, and that will happen in the last day. Well, I think the problem is the last day does not necessarily always mean a 24-hour day, although certainly all things will culminate in one last day and one last hour. Everything will culminate in that. But the last day, very often in, in Scripture or in that day, um, refers to an age, a period of time. For instance, the day of the Lord, as we read in Joel. All the things that must happen in that day are things that would take more than 24 hours to, to um, take place. And I'll give some examples of that. In Jeremiah 30 is an excellent chapter that has much to do with um, the days that are coming. Let's take a look through it, and we'll just do a, a quick run-through um, because, as you'll see, it refers to a particular time in future history the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, thus says the Lord God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. So future time, when they'll take possession of it, it's the land that he gave to their fathers. Now, the borders that he gave to their fathers, um, Israel did make it in there. They've been in there. Um, they were in there for many, many years. There was uh, a time when the Babylonians captured them, and um, most of them were removed and in captivity. And then uh, they came back into the land. And uh, then we have... Um, 1948, when they were a desert, they were not even called Israel. It was just called generally the land of Palestine. So they were brought back into the land, but they have yet to possess all the borders that was promised to Abraham. The day is coming when that will ultimately be fulfilled. Uh, even now, this is all being fulfilled, although we're seeing the beginnings of this because um, we read in the scripture that God says, I will bring you back a second time. Didn't say a third time or a fourth time or what have you, but a second time. Therefore, since the Babylonian captivity and then 70 AD when uh, the Jews were expelled, fled to all the countries, all the nations, they have only now begun to return uh, since the 20th century a second time. 
So that process has begun, but it's not yet complete. So here, these are the words of the Lord that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. In verse 5, thus says the Lord, We have heard a cry of panic, of terror, and no peace. And now, ask, or ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Well, ask some people out there down the street and they'll say, sure. Ridiculous. Why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why is every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob. As some translations will say, the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is Jacob? Remember, his name was changed to Israel. So it is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. There's a couple things here that um, I want to point out, and that is that the, the day is so great, there is none like it. I have been told by some, they like to believe that that is just hyperbole, that it's going to be a really bad time, um, only not in reference to this passage that we're talking about, Matthew 24, where Jesus said that when this time comes, and he was describing the time of tribulation and the time of great tribulation, that at that time, there will never have been a time since the beginning that has been so bad, nor will there be after that time. And then sometimes they'll say, nah, he's just speaking hyperbole. You know, it's going to be a really rough time. There's no reason to apply hyperbole there in that passage. This passage here says the same thing. And I don't see in here any precedence for saying that it's hyperbole. Do you? This is the last that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob or Israel, yet he shall be saved out of it. And it shall come to pass in that day. There's that term again. So is it a little literal 24-hour day? Well, let's continue to read. And you can see the context lends itself to saying that this is really about an era and time. It shall come to pass in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck, and I will burst your bonds, and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Did that happen in 70 AD? Nope. Of course, this is speaking of the Messiah. We know the promise. Jeremiah didn't... Um, perhaps know about this promise at the time he wrote this under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But Gabriel told Mary, how would her son rule? He would sit on David's throne. And this is who the Jews are looking for. The Jews, when they're looking for their Messiah, say they're looking for two things. One, he must be of the line of Judah or the tribe of Judah. Two, he must be of uh, the line of David. And three, he must build our temple. Those three things are what the rabbis in Israel will tell us now. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for, behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. I will make a full end of the nations, of all the nations, uh, among whom I scattered you. So clearly, they were scattered in 70 AD. So this is post-70 AD. Now, were they returned post-70 AD before 1948? So he's speaking of an era, that day or those days, that is all post-70 AD. Nothing in history between 1st century to 1948 ever saw um, biblical prophecy for Israel being fulfilled directly as in this manner. So he's speaking of all, all of modern, day, modern time, modern days. But of you, I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure and I will be by no means leave you unpunished because your guilt is great. Because your sins are flagrant, I have done these things to you. So he's speaking of that day. 
of the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the chapter we're in, right? Therefore, all who devour you shall be devoured. So the ones that the Lord is sending against Israel, the nations, he's going to devour them. And we see this in Ezekiel 38 with similar language in that day, in that day, in that day, in Ezekiel 38 with Gog and Magog, where um, God puts the hook in the jaw of Gog. God says, I will lead you by the nose. You have these thoughts in your mind, but I'm going to lead you by the nose and then I'm going to destroy you. Um, and he, God does. He destroys them on the hills just outside of of Jerusalem, outside of Israel. And all your foes, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall be plundered. And all who prey on you, I will make a prey. By who? Antichrist and his forces. And all who prey on you, I will make prey, for I will restore health to you. When's that going to happen? And your wounds, I will heal. All these things are post- the time of Jacob's trouble, so after the second coming, right? Declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast. It is Zion for whom no one cares. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob, in other words, Israel, and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt on its mound, and the place shall stand where it used to be. Out of them shall come songs of thanksgiving and the voices of, of those who celebrate. I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will make them honored and they shall not be small. Their children shall be as they were of old and their congregation shall be established before me. And I will punish all who, who oppress them. Verse 21, and their prince shall be one of themselves. Their rulers shall come out of their midst. I will make him draw near, and he shall approach me, for who would dare of himself to approach me, declares the Lord, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth. This is a time of wrath, a time of Jacob's trouble. Same thing as the day of the Lord. We're talking about wrath. Same thing we read in Ezekiel 38. It's a time of wrath. You look at 38, look at about verse 19, God's great anger and his wrath. A whirling tempest, it will burst forth uh, upon the head of the wicked, the fierce anger. There's that wrath again. Of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind. In the latter days, you will understand this. So it's just clearly talking about the latter days, and it's talking about in those days and in that day. So the latter days are everything from Israel coming back into the land at this time of wrath. But then he also is earlier talking about, I'm going to restore all your fortunes and it's called the Millennial Kingdom, even though it's just in Revelation 20, it's called the Millennial Kingdom because it's a kingdom that's established during this time when Satan is bound for a thousand years. So, but obviously the kingdom is, lasts longer than that because Satan is bound for a thousand years, and then after a thousand years, he's loose, the army happens, whatever, but God is still king. He, he will be, Christ will be king forever and ever on his throne, and there's gonna be, he's not going to be moving out anytime soon. So there are more passages that um, I could list about that day and in those days, and maybe I will put them in the notes below in the description, list some of those passages um, just for the sake of time. But for the sake of pulling some of this together, for instance, what we read about that time and 1 Corinthians 15 uh, about at the last trumpet and what that looks like and being changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, and the timing of all that, how it cannot be post. Some people will look at the word at the last trumpet and they'll try to say, well, that's the last trumpet, the trumpet judgments. Okay, well then, so you're saying that um, we're going to be going, as the church, the body of Christ, we're going to be going through all of this period of wrath all the way up till the seventh trumpet judgment in the, the book of Revelation, which also would include the seventh trumpet heralds the bowl judgments. So the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, is the bowls. So you're saying essentially that the church is going to go through all that time of wrath. Well, so I want to look at, again, I want to go beginning in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, beginning verse 13. Paul's 
speaking says or writing says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, this is going to be similar to 1 Corinthians 15 about those who sleep or those who are dead. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who fall asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who fall asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. So there again, we've got the trumpet of God again, and we've got um, with the voice of an, of an archangel, one archangel, trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. That's the word harpazo in the Greek, caught up. Um, it is in the Hebrew wedding tradition, it's the taking and it's when the bridegroom comes and takes his bride. He doesn't come all the way to earth. He doesn't come all the way to the bride's house. He goes to the gate. And that's the wedding tradition. And then there's the taking. He takes his bride and they go to the father's house and they have a week of wedding celebration. We who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so... We will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And this is part of the Hebrew wedding tradition too. The bridegroom goes away for roughly a year. Um, and he prepares a place at his father's house or on his property somewhere. There's a couple different ways that that can happen. And then when he, um, his father will go and make approval of the changes and the additions to the home. Uh, this is part of the tradition. And then when he approves, he will tell the son, the bridegroom, go get your bride. So that's how that works. That's why the son in the tradition doesn't know exactly when it's going to take place, when he's coming to take his bride, because he's got to get the approval of the father. So the father looks around, makes suggested changes, if there are any changes that have to happen. So the father looks around, approves of it, and says, go take your bride. The bridegroom gets his wedding party together, his best man. And they go through town with a processional and they're headed to the bride's house and, and they're making a little bit of a ruckus and uh, the townsfolk come out and they're excited because it's probably about midnight just for a bit of fun. And um, they're excited because they've been anticipating this celebration for a while. And the bridegroom and his party merge with the bride's party at the gate and her virgins or bridesmaids. Then the party goes on, goes back to the father's house where they're shut in for um, a full week. Nobody in or out. The door is closed. They have a week-long celebration. So that's what's happening here. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. And you know the place where I'm going. So that's all part of the wedding tradition. I just wanted to uh, highlight that as, a, as kind of a reminder so, coming back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Uh, I will be encouraged because that would have to happen um, as in the days of Noah, before, before, before the judgment. And as in the days of Lot, when Lot and family were rescued from Sodom before 
the wrath, before all that stuff happened. Not out of the middle of it, but before. Chapter 5 of First Thessalonians. Now, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, of Joel, it's a time of wrath, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Oh no. Some people say, oh look, secret rapture. Secret to who? Was the flood a secret to the people that left, on the, left behind on the earth when uh, Noah and the family went on the ark? It wasn't a secret to Noah. Noah knew. He was preparing. He was prepared. He had an ark. And one day the Lord said, Noah, it's time for you and the family to get on. And the Lord finished leading the animals onto the ark. So he was prepared. So while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains. Not you, them. As labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We're not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let's be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for our helmet, the hope of salvation. Hope uh, is one word that means um, expectation. It's a sure thing. It's not, gee, I really hope my team wins this weekend. Hope is an expectation. Um, and salvation, he's speaking to the church here, right? So he's not talking about their, the salvation of their souls. Salvation can be a term which generally just means deliverance. And clearly, everybody must agree that he's talking about uh, a deliverance because their souls are, are already eternally saved. But since we belong to the day, let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the expectation of our deliverance. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we're awake or asleep, we might live with him. In other words, he died for us. He already took on wrath, right? Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. He didn't say buckle up because it's going to be a bumpy ride going through the wrath of God, the day of the Lord. Take a quick look over here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look down toward the very end. For they themselves, verse 9, report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So these are believers here and turn from idols to serve the living and true God. And what? To wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who does what? delivers us from the wrath to come. So we're not going into this. If you want more, and I've pointed this out before, and there are more videos about this, take a look at Revelation 3.10. To the faithful church, what is Jesus saying? If I had the little red letter edition button pressed on this in this browser, I, this would be red text here. This is because... You've kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you, Tyrio Ek, from the hour of trial or tribulation. That's coming where? It's coming on the whole world. For what purpose? To try those, not you, who dwell on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth. Wait, Jesus, I'm, I'm dwelling on the earth. We're dwelling on the earth right now, aren't we? We're dwelling on the earth, so it's meant to try those who... But how are you going to keep us from the hour of trial if we're dwelling on the earth? Well, he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So if we're not dwelling, we're not living on the earth, where are we? 
Are we on the moon? Uh, uh, a Mars base? I don't know. So he says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial. Uh, Tyrell Eck, he's going to remove us utterly and completely out of the way. That's what it says in the Greek. Um, and it's out of the path of an oncoming train. Utterly and completely, com completely, totally remove us from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. The whole world. So we're not getting off onto an island somewhere or hiding in a cave. No, it's a trial that's coming on the whole world to try those, that would be everybody, who dwell on the earth. So we're removed from wrath. We're not going to be in wrath. Now, I pointed out before, too, um, that the text says uh, at the last trump, um, also... We re read in First Thessalonians that there is a shout from an archangel, and there is um, the blast of of a trump, or it's at the last trump. Let's take a look. We can we can go up here, Revelation, and let, take a look at the second coming at that last trump and the shout of an archangel. Okay, we can verify it that way, right? So heaven's rejoicing; they're up there re rejoicing. John's down on earth at this point, and he's hearing heaven rejoicing, and all the angels are making quite a, a, a fuss. And uh, they're looking at salvation and glory and the destruction of the earth and, and um, all the praise and, and glory that it's, it's coming. And at the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, is a, it's, it's a, right around the corner. I mean, it's here, look what the Lord's doing, and they're exulting in heaven. So they are celebrating, they're praising, they're excited about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And um, so John falls down, he's worshiping, and he's praising. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Then one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh is um, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel um, standing in the sun with a loud voice, and he called to the birds directly overhead, um, come and gather for the, the great supper of God. So this is different from the marriage supper, right? So there's a supper that's for the believers, and it's the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then there's the supper here. So here in Revelation 19, what I want you to notice is, where is that archangel? And where is that last trumpet? Where's that trumpet? The absence of that means that we are probably looking at two different events. So what we have is two different events. So Dave, are you saying that there are two comings? Well, we call the second coming, we call it the second coming because it's him actually coming back to the earth. He left. We call it the second coming. So is there a partial coming? Well, we meet the Lord in the air. That's what the scripture says, right? Do we meet the Lord in the air and then return right back, whoop, whoop, right back with him when he comes back? And if so, that's the rapture. And if that's the rapture, we all have glorified bodies then. And then again, we've got the issue going into the kingdom where you have no mortals. Everybody's in glorified bodies by that point. I mean, you'll have, um, at the, after this point here, when he comes back, you have the sheep and the goats judgment. So all the unbelievers, you know, they've been thrown in outer darkness. Um, and, and they're waiting their turn for the great white throne judgment. So here, then you've got all believers left. And then Jesus says in Matthew 25, to enter into the kingdom, um, you know, that's prepared for them. So that happens. Uh, either way, you've got a bunch of people with glorified bodies and no mortals to go into the kingdom. So the timing of that, the change in the moment, and the twinkling of an eye, doesn't work at the second coming. Um, so it's a separate event. has to happen um, at the rapture. That event we read about at the last trumpet. We read in First Thessalonians 
about a trumpet, a shout from an archangel. Here we have no trumpet. We have no archangel in, in um, Revelation chapter um, 19. So if we have one event where you've got an, the voice of an archangel, we meet the Lord in the air and there's a shout and there's a trumpet. But yet second coming, you got all the angels making a bunch of noise and you got no trumpet. Um, you've got two different events going on. So I just want to wanted to point that out and to clarify that. And that is, um, you know, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial um, position. And um, I hope that helps. I hope that clarifies. Make up your own mind. Um, decide. In 1 John 2.18, it talks about the last hour. And he says, uh, you know, little children, it is the last hour. On the grand scheme of things, yes, it's hyperbolic language. It's been the last hour since the first century. What is the deal with saying in the last day and saying, no, 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 it's got to be that last 24-hour day. You don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. Okay, we'll explain how that in the first century, John is writing that it is the last hour. So we're talking about an epoch, an era here. And it's it, this is hyperbolic language. And it must be, because that was the last hour then, in in the first century. And he's talking also about future events in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 30, uh, Ezekiel 30, 38, and many other passages talk about um, that day, in those days, at that time. And so it talks about an era that's coming, that is going to be everything from... Um, Israel beginning to come back into the land, them being punished, God meeting out judgment on those who um, go after and create trouble for Israel, and then restoration for Israel um, uh, after that time. So that is that time, that day, or those days. So I hope that is clear for you. I'll try to put these some more verses down here that talk about that day or those days so that you can read the whole passage and see how that there are too many events that have to happen, especially like Ezekiel 38, where you got the staging of an army. In that day, I'm going to bring all these armies in. I'm going to put them up there. And so it's definitely, it takes more than one day for that to happen. And so far, those, many of those armies are already there now across the border of Israel. And that, that took more than a day for them to get there. And they're still there. So Clearly now we're already more than a 24-hour day since that army has been staged. Um, it's really easy to spiritualize things away and to just call out symbolism just to try to sweep things under the rug and make them go away. But the problem is the first time Jesus came and he fulfilled all these Old Testament prophecies, everything actually physically, literally happened. And none of it was symbolic. There are no symbolic fulfillments of Jesus' first coming. Why would there be a bunch of symbolic fulfillments to his second? Be bold. Study the scriptures. Study to show yourselves approved. And trust in the Lord. Um, we'll get through whatever time is left. And we'll glory in him forever and ever. And then none of this stuff will matter anymore. Um, because we're going to be glorifying him. Enjoying his creation. Enjoying his new creation. And uh, for all eternity. Have a good evening.